if we are up and here we go we are recording now so that is great so um so i think we are good to go uh again welcome back if you if this is the first time welcome uh and if you were joined any uh any of the uh presentations we did last month uh welcome back uh, so today, uh, I'm Paul Winsky. I am I the am horticulture Paul. agent, and I'll uh, be speaking about landscape plants for the shade. Uh, next week, uh, Mr. Shannon Dietz will be back. Um, we got a lot of positive feedback, and people wanted more information on backyard poultry. So we will be doing uh, part. He will be doing part two of that. Um, um, on the 18th, uh, Kim will be back talking about growing 10 outstanding herbs. And on the 25th, uh, we'll be covering youth gardening, getting started, and Brandy Keller will be uh, leading that talk. So uh, with that being said, uh, let's jump into this. So landscape plants for the shade. And this is always a challenge. Uh, you, if you move into a new house, you probably don't have a lot of shade. Uh, and if you move into a older house or uh, you may have a more mature landscape, so you're dealing probably with uh, some shade issues. And so this um, talk came about from some of the feedback we uh, received from uh, last month uh, from, from some of the uh, comments you made. So um, as you know, I'd like to start this off with uh, you folks doing a little bit of work, and uh, it's not going to be a word cloud this time. Uh, that was a comment people, uh, some folks didn't like the word cloud, so if you uh, put put it in uh, with a, a name of a plant, so if you uh, text to 37607 and you text Paul Winsky 227, uh, that will give you access and then um, punch in a name of the uh, a plant that you've used um, that performs well in the shade. Uh, just so I can get an idea. Uh, here's one. We've got Camellia. OK, so um, we'll take a minute or two for you guys to if you've got your phones, punch that in. And uh, I always like to see what what works, what doesn't work. Turk's cap. OK, that's a good uh, perennial to use. And Turk's cap is quite a sturdy plant, which will do well in the sun or shade. So that's uh, that's a good one to know. Let's see if we get any other takers and we get any other uh, additions uh, to this list. All right. I think. We might be hitting our limit. Let's see if we can get a couple more in there with some ideas. And if not, we will move on because we've got plenty of uh, ideas to give you uh, in order to. Here we go. Oh, coleus. Very good. Good choice. Good choice. Does well in sun and shade, but those colors really pop in the shade. Mist flower. OK, excellent. Excellent. Good choice. All right. It's always good to hear and see what other folks, azaleas, azaleas and hydrangeas. I'm going to let you guys know right now. Um, I am not going to touch on azaleas or hydrangeas because I think everybody knows that they do quite well uh, in the shade. So um, we will uh, just uh, everybody will assume that they're going to know that porter weeds, stacky tarfetta, very good. Um, great perennial to use in the shade. OK, so I am going to go ahead and lock this and we are going to move on. Thank you for your input. And I hope this version was a little bit easier for you guys to see and read as to um, what everybody is uh, has been successful with in the shade. OK, so let's move on. So I'm going to cover annuals, perennials, some grasses and shrubs. So I'll give you some ideas in all these areas of, uh, of plants that work well in the shade. So it should give you a good palette um, and, and plenty of ideas as you go forward. So here's one that maybe people didn't think about. This is Alternanthera. This is a foliage type plant. Uh, so we're not growing this for the uh, flowers. We're growing it for its colored foliage. So here's the one up in the top corner. Uh, Party time has these uh, red pinkish colors along with the green. Uh, and they this performs very well in the sun and in the shade. Uh, I think the colors look much better in the shade on this one. Um, this one, uh, party time, will probably get up to about um, 12 to 18 inches uh, in height. Again, in the shade, it's probably going to be a little bit more compact, a little bit tighter growth. 
purple night is this nice dark foliage, uh, very deep purple, probably about 12 to 14 inches in height. And you can see how that works well uh, in this bed. And then we've got Little Ruby. Now, Little Ruby is also a Texas superstar plant. Uh, Little Ruby probably uh, tops out at about 12 inches. Um, in, this, in the sun, it might be uh, a little bit uh, taller than that. Um, but the new growth is green. And then as, as it matures, it gets this uh, purple color, this, this ruby-like color. So Alternanthera is one that is one annual that does well. Begonia, again, begonia are both sun and shade, um, but there's just so many out there now. Um, one of the new Texas or one of the Texas superstars is the Whopper, and we're seeing a trend in some of the breeding that the uh, foliage is larger, the plants are larger, the um, uh, flowers are larger. The one thing I do, uh, you know, I will, uh, you know, caution you on or, or one tip is that if you buy the bronze foliage ones um, in the shade, that bronze foliage is not going to be as intense as it would be um, if it was in the sun. So it might be a little bit muddy in its in its color. Um, but if you get that in full sun, uh, that foliage is going to get very dark. But you've got pinks, reds, um, whites. Uh, so begonia is very versatile, but it does add a nice color pop uh, in the shade. Uh, hypoestis, pol polka dot plant. Um, probably not used as much as it should be, um, but there's been a lot of breeding uh, lately. Uh, the Hippo series is one that comes to mind. Uh, in fact, these two, uh, the pink and the red down below, they are both in, in the uh, from the Hippo series. That's uh, uh, proven winners uh, genetics. But you can see um, very nice color contrast. So in a, in a sh uh, deeply shaded area, these colors would definitely jump out at you. Um, and add some nice color, some nice depth, and uh, a little bit of texture uh, to the landscape. Impatience. At one time, impatience, uh, they were probably one of the top three bedding plants in the industry. Great colors, great habit, flowers over the entire plant. So um, work extremely well, and, and they, they, they love the shade. Um, but then this happened about 10 years ago, nine years ago, impatience downy mildew um, reared its ugly head and basically wiped out the impatience market. And this is what it does to the plant. So um, there are two series that are out in the market now. And I know I've seen Beacon, but there's the Beacon series and the Amara series. And they are impatience downy mildew uh, resistant. Uh, so this is images, these are images of their field trials, um, the ones, uh, and I believe, I, I know MRs, this was uh, trials over in England where impatience downy mildew is very prevalent. Um, these in, um, uh, from the Beacon series, I'm not sure where that trial was, so they were either inoculated or they were, um, uh, it, it, it just uh, happened uh, on its own, but you can see how well these plants hold up. Um, between those that were infected and those that weren't. Uh, so again, Beacon Series or Amaras, um, keep your eye out for them. If you, if you like impatience and you've had a hard time uh, keeping them alive because of this downy mildew issue, um, these are two series that I would definitely keep an eye on and give them a shot to see how well uh, they will, they will uh, perform for you in the landscape. Uh, and last on the annuals is, is sweet potato vine. You can see sort of a trend that a lot of these foliage plants can bring color, can bring texture, uh, could add depth to the landscape. And sweet potato vine is one that has really come a long way. Um, when we first started out, you had the chartreuse of, of marguerite, and then you had the dark foliage of blackie. Now you look at the, the different shades, the different colors. So, um, whether if you've got combination planters that you're or you're putting in the shade or uh, you just want it as a ground cover, as an annual ground cover to give it a pop of color, um, sweet, sweet potato vine uh, will fit in nicely. All right, um, perennials. So let's touch on a couple perennials that will do well in the shade. Um, Farfugium, leopard plant, used to be Ligularia. 
and the botanist, for whatever reason, changed the genus on us. Um, but this is the giganteum, so this is the giant leopard plant, and uh, very bold look uh, in the landscape. Glossy foliage, dark green foliage, almost looks like uh, lily pads, um, and if they were floating on the water. Um, but then you've also got um, some of these variegated ones, uh, where it looks like somebody came through with a uh, paintbrush with yellow paint and just went through and, and started flicking on it. Um, they do bloom. So this is what the, uh, the flower spikes would look on it. And this is usually, um, I believe they're spring bloomers. Um, so um, leopard plant can give you unique colors, unique textures, uh, and they just love the, love the shade. So they do extremely well there. Uh, ferns, okay. Um, and there's, you know, more ferns than you can shake a stick at, um, but they will definitely thrive. Um, the deeper the shade, even the better. Um, but you can see down here, like with the uh, Japanese holly fern, how it soft softens the line of those uh, boulders. Um, you've got foxtail, uh, you've got the soft shield polystechum. So, and there's just, we, we could probably do a whole hour talk just on ferns um, for the Gulf Coast. So there is uh, plenty out there. It really just depends what you're looking for and what look and what texture uh, it is that you want to add to your landscape. Um, peacock gingers. How many of you are transplants from the Northeast or the Midwest and you used to have hostas? Well, hostas struggle down here. Uh, in fact, I would not recommend a hosta. Uh, you could try it, and I've seen them in, in, in a few places, but in general, um, the hostas just just don't, don't like our humidity. They don't like our soils. Um, so if you want something that's going to give you that look of a hosta, uh, these gingers, the Campheria genus, work extremely well. This is a variety called Alva. Now, just like a hosta, they will die back during the winter. They'll go dormant. And then as the soil temperatures start to warm, uh, temperatures go up, they will start to put out their foliage. And again, we are growing these for their foliage. You can see they've got some, you know, small flowers that are in there. Um, you can see it's sort of a, uh, a, a pinkish violet color uh, for Alva. Uh, and then here's gold uh, uh, peacock, jungle gold. Um, and this one is, it's got nice on the underside. It, it's got a, uh, sort of a reddish, uh, pink to it. Uh, we've got variegated, uh, green and white on the top and down at the base, this one will flower also, and you'll see a little yellow flower down at the base. So again, if you want that look, um, of a, you know, quote unquote hosta for the South, uh, Camp Feria is the way to go. Um, I know, uh, the Mercer Arboretum used to have a great collection of these. Uh, I don't know how it's held up with all the flooding, um, but it'd probably be about this time of year that they will start uh, emerging. So if you're out at the Mercer, uh, go ahead and, and, and see if you can find them because um, um, they used to have a really good collection and you'd get a really good idea of uh, what these plants could do and how they would perform. Chinese ground orchid, Blatilla. Now, this is going to be a, an early, uh, late winter, early spring bloomer. Um, so this is one that I really, I love this. We used to grow these in quartz when I was in the industry. Um, it's sort of this fuchsia uh, pink color. Um, there's white varieties. There's even a yellow variety. So uh, it sends up these spikes. Foliage comes up first, and then it sends up these spikes, uh, and it will bloom uh, up the uh, from the bottom on up through the top. Uh, but again, early spring. So you know the one thing I, I always like to stress when you're you're considering these plants is um, Make sure you have interest in your garden throughout the year. Uh, I know the annuals you can, we can always put annuals in, but the perennials and, and even the shrubs that bloom, um, you want something to, to, to keep your interest, uh, to get you out there uh, on a regular basis uh, and to turn around and, and be able to see uh, something new each time you walk the garden. <clears throat> uh, here's another one, a, a tropical, but it, it does perennialize here. This is curcuma. Uh, tulip ginger. So here's kimono deep res, deep rose, blushing star. Um, 
some people or most people probably think the white section up here is the flower. Actually, they're they're bracts, similar to uh, poinsettias, where the the red part uh, we every you know most people think that that is the flower, but it's not. And the flower is actually located right in these uh sepals it down and through here so you can see one sitting there you can see one sitting here so these are the actual flowers but everybody notices the bracts and that's what catches your eye so some of these are about a foot tall i've seen several that are can be even taller so gingers do uh of course because of our climate they perform extremely well here um and they will uh just uh, continue to bloom throughout the entire summer um, one that, that's great that works well as a ground cover is a juga, uh, very low growing. So you can see in this picture when it does bloom, uh, it puts up these uh, spikes of uh, like powder blue flowers. Um, they mature when they bloom, probably at, at about six to 10 inches tall. I would say more, you know, six to eight. Uh, it is a spring bloomer. Uh, this one you can use in sun or shade, but uh, for the shade, they really do thrive. And they, you can really have some interesting colors and textures here. So this is actually burgundy scallop. So even when it's not in bloom, you've got something really neat to look at. Uh, and this is chocolate chip. So the new growth is dark uh, and it looks like you know chocolate chips, I guess. And then as it matures, it sort of gets this... Um, muddied like foliage with the, with a little bit of a maroon uh, pigmentation in it. So um, does extremely well. And these are uh, um, very good plants. Once they're established, um, they'll be drought tolerant and um, just perform extremely well. All right. Um, just a quick, uh, since we're at a break here, Brandy, you have any questions for me or are we good? No questions, Paul. This is okay. Kim. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Okay, uh, so we'll move on. Uh, grasses, liriope, um, or when I moved to Texas, people were calling it liriope. So uh, just depends on where you are from, but liriope gives you that nice uh, texture, um, really good landscape plant. You can use it as a specimen plant on its own. It will get nice and large. It'll have this arching foliage, and then you'll see these uh, either nice lavender or white flower spikes that will uh, emerge in the spring. Um, again, it will work well in the sun or shade, which is good. So um, if you have it in a spot, you know, early on where it's in sun and then you've got trees that grow up around it and uh, you, you're then in heavy shade, um, you won't have to find another plant. This plant will continue on and, and work extremely well. Uh, there's variegata also. So even when it's not in bloom, you've got some color with that nice green and white uh, foliage. Mondo grass, Ophiopogon. Um, again, another nice soft textured, uh, maybe a little bit finer in the foliage compared to Liriope. Uh, it is evergreen. Again, this is another one that will can go from sun to shade, um, but I really like it in the shade. Uh, it, it, it has a really nice effect. Oh, sorry about that. And then we also have, there's a dark foliage one uh, called nigra or nigrescence. Um, this is gonna be, if you find it and you, and you like it, um, I would say purchase it if you wanna give it a shot. It is a very slow grower, um, especially with it being in the shade. Um, it, it performs well, um, it has a nice, uh, color and texture, um, but um, it is a very slow grower because of the uh, the type the the, the uh, color of that foliage. And then there's Dianella, and Dianella is is a, a, a broader shaped uh, leaf to it. Um, it is variegated. We've got uh, green and golds. We have uh, green and whites. Um, there's all green. Uh, there are ones that have even like a, a bluish tinge to them, which perform extremely well. They do flower. They will send up a spike and it will have a little star shaped uh, flower along the, uh, the stem. Um, blue petals and I believe it the, the center is a, a, an off yellow or a light yellow um, but again this gives you a really interesting look uh, and it, it's a way of bringing color into those dark areas uh, in the landscape okay we are going to head into shrubs uh, Kim or Brandy any questions or should I keep moving on 
keep moving on. Keep moving on. All right. Works for me. All right. So shrubs, aspidistra, cast iron plant. Um, it's interesting that th this falls under shrubs, but it's one of those, the, the way the plant grows, it, to me, it reminds me of a perennial, but it is evergreen. Um, once it's established, it, it, it does an extremely nice job filling in uh, spots. Um, one air, uh, variety, Milky Way, which is over here, it's got these, um, uh, you know, spotting on it. It's got some variegation to it. But there are people that are aspidistra collectors that spend a lot of money on aspidistras, and they come in all shapes and sizes. So um, there is a lot out there. What we normally see is this typical green. Um, we may see Mil Milky Way, um, but if you Google uh, aspidistra, there are some specialty nurseries out there um, that have some really unique varieties. This is a very um, uh, popular plant in Japan. Um, so there's a lot of genetics coming out of there, and um, there are really some unique forms and, and really cool habits uh, that are out there for aspidistra, but does does extremely well. Um, the typical green probably gets up to about knee high, um, so it's a great great plant that fills in uh, various spaces. <clears throat> are Nandina, these native, Paul? Sorry. Um, no, I, I would say they are not. I, they're probably native. Since a lot of them come out of Japan, I would tend to think they probably originated there. Okay. Um, Nandina, we're, we're, we're used to seeing, uh, you know, Nandina around, used a lot in, in um, foundation plantings. It does bloom. Um, the one thing I do want to say is there's a lot of new uh, genetics out there on this. I mean, Gulfstream was was really set the bar. Um, that is now off patent. There's varieties like Firepower, Sunray, Tuscan Flame that the new growth just really lights up. So even in the shade, um, whether it's a deep purple or a, or a bright yellow that goes orange, um, there's some really good um, uh Foliage out there, uh, the new growth looks great. And then the overall habit of these, you know, very compact, very tight, very, very uh, neat and clean plants um, that you can use uh, in the shade. Uh, Mahonia, this is one of my favorites. Uh, we, I used to do new product development and um, this blooms early. So like right after Christmas and sometime in January where, you know, the, the Christmas, uh, uh, rush is settling down and and this uh, starts to bloom and it puts out these uh, spikes with these yellow flowers and you cannot miss it when you see it. Uh, and then once these uh, flowers have been pollinated, um, you see these clusters of uh, um, blueberries almost. They look like blueberries. A uh, common name I think on the Mahonia is a lot of people refer to it as it was called Oregon grape holly because um, you stick your hand in there, you're going to feel it. It's it's going to scratch you up a bit. Um, but these are just great. Uh, I, I think they're under underutilized. Um, there's a lot of different varieties out there. There's a lot of different species of Mahonia. Um, but for the shade, it's a really good plant. And again, it's something that will get you out into the garden in January and February when, you know, maybe you're getting a little stir crazy well, I guess we're all getting a little stir crazy being indoors now, but this this plant uh, at that time of year, that yellow color just screams at you. You can't miss it. Uh, but then again, here's another one. So here's Mahonia Eurobracteata. Uh, and this is soft caress. And this is part of the uh, Southern Living uh, series. And this is, it's almost got a fern-like look to it. Or, or a bamboo-like look to it. Um, this one, you can rub your hand through it, very soft, very delicate. It still gets the uh, flower spikes, um, maybe not as um, prominent as what we saw with Charity, but um, they, they still uh, put those blooms out and they do extremely well. So this is one, and this probably tops out at about, only about three feet. This one's a little bit more compact. Um, and, and just uh, gives a great look uh, in the landscape. It's a very, again, another neat and tidy plant um, that you can use. 
All right. Akubas. Uh, Akubas are really kind of cool plants. Uh, you can find them. Uh, again, this is another one. There's a lot of breeding um, and, and a lot of genetics that comes out of Japan. Uh, this is the typical uh, green foliage, uh, probably tops out. Some of them can get up to six feet tall, seven feet tall. Um, they will set, the females will set a nice bright red fruit. Some varieties I've seen that the fruit is higher up in the plant. Other varieties, the fruit is lower down in the plant. So it really, uh, you know, just depends on what either species or variety it is. Uh, and this fruit is usually evident right around Christmas time. So again, something else to go out and look at uh, in the landscape when this is there. Uh, this is gold dust. So again, um, uh, the foliage is is what's going to grab you and so you can see that yellow and green variegation um very very prominent uh so you know you can just picture that in in a shaded shaded area uh that that color is just going to really draw you in and uh you know give you something to work with really also with uh complementary plants around it Camellias, um, you know, if you're in the south, camellias are, gr are, are, are great. Um, so the Sasanquas, the other thing that's great is you can extend the blooming of camellias because we've got two species that work extremely well down here. So we've got the Sasanquas, which are our fall and winter uh, bloomers. Um, this uh, picture right here, this is Yuletide. This is one of my favorites. Um, again, right around Christmas time. In December, this one starts to bloom, and just those yellow stamens against that uh, bright red single flower. Nothing real fancy, but that contrast just really jumps out at you. So the sank the sanquas are your fall winter uh, bloomers, and then we've got our japonicas, which are our spring bloomers. So about the time the sanquas are going out, japonicas can come in. So you can see again, we want that progression of flowers throughout the entire season, uh, throughout the entire year, which is great uh, for us down here in the Gulf Coast because we're we're able to do things like that, and the. the uh, Japonicas, uh, you've got singles, you've got doubles. This is a peony type. You have anemone type. You've got single colors, bi colors, you name it. Um, the camellias uh, really run the whole gamut. Uh, there's a couple nurseries over in North Carolina that are mail order, and that's they focus on camellias. So, you know, if you're looking for a specific color, or a specific flower type, um, you know, they would have it and, and they do extremely well. So um, great plant for the shade. Uh, this one, I don't know if everybody is aware of this one, but Osmanthus is a great, great plant. Um, it doesn't look like much in this image here, um, but when it is in bloom, these clusters of these little white flowers are so fragrant that you, you just can't pass it by. Um, they do extremely well down here. I, I used to love these would be in bloom and the fragrance would be wafting through the air on the nursery about the same time as that Mahonia charity was in in bloom. So um, after the first of the year, January, February, these guys, they start putting on their show and, and the flowers really pretty insignificant. But the fragrance just really, and it, and it's not a real uh, super sweet. It's not, you know, it, it's one that it's once you smell it, you love it. Um, so this is one, you know, you're going to use it back in the bed a little bit further, tuck it away. Um, it stays evergreen. Um, foliage is nice, very healthy plant. But when it blooms, um, you are going to know it's in bloom, and and it's uh, it, it's worth waiting for. So. Um, with that, do we have any additional questions? Uh, let me click on over here to see if I see anything. Um, Brandy, okay, yes, let's see. There are several questions. Okay, go for it, Kim. All right, let me scroll back up. I'm trying to take these in order. Okay, it says, any suggestions for plants that do well in hanging baskets and shade? We have a very shady walkway. Okay, uh, great question. So, so some of those annuals um, that I had listed will do well in hanging baskets. Uh, you can always go with some of the ferns. 
um, in hanging baskets and they'll they'll hold up for you, um, you know, uh, throughout the year. Uh, so um, and what I've seen people do is they'll you do the ferns and then they'll they'll do them in bigger baskets and then they'll pop in some annuals just to give it a little bit color for that time of year. So in the cool season, they'll pop in maybe some uh, uh, pansies or violas, something like that. And then uh, maybe in the uh, warmer seasons, they'll pop in uh, uh, they'll put some impatience in or something like that. So uh, I think some of the plants that we had listed there um, uh, on the annuals uh, will do well, uh, but then the, uh, the, um, uh, the ferns will do well also. So hopefully that helps you out. Next one. Okay, next question from Carla. Does the tulip ginger produce an edible tuber slash root? Um, good question, and I honestly don't know. Um, it's it's been interesting. I've been doing a couple talks, and people are looking more about you know which flowers are edible and things like that. I honestly don't know if that curcuma, if that root on that ginger is edible or not. Um, so I am not going to commit one way or another. I'm sure um, uh, you know if you you put that genus in uh, and uh, googled it to see if that. Uh, the root from uh, curcuma uh, altissima folia is, is uh, edible. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find uh, an answer to that, but I do not know. Okay, Paul, this is from Linda. Are Nardinia berries poisonous to birds? Nardinia berries, not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I don't think so because I've, um, I've seen them. I've seen some older plants um, go ahead and um, bloom, uh, set seed. Uh, I've seen birds eat them, and I have not seen. You know, uh, I guess it might be like anything else. It, it might depend on the quantity, but I I do not think that the nandina berries are, or or the fruits are poisonous. I know in certain uh, certain states, um, they are becoming uh, somewhat invasive. Um, so I would say if they are starting to become invasive, the birds must be eating them and dropping them in spots and, um, you know, causing the issues that way. So um, I do not believe they are uh, poisonous. Okay, this is from Kristen. What are the soil requirements for Mahona, Mahonia? Mahonia? I, I would think um, there's nothing out of the ordinary. It doesn't require acidic uh, I think just good bed preparation uh, that you would use for any of the uh, other shrubs you know when you're putting in your planting um, you know good compost working it work it in um, and, and just try to amend that soil as best as possible okay we have a couple more Paul uh, this is from uh, Lindsay does the fragrant olive bear fruit you know, I, it's, it's kind of funny because that plant is, it's, the, the blooms are insignificant. I would tend to think it's got to set some sort of type of seed, um, but I, I honestly don't know because usually once it's done blooming, you, you sort of forget about the plant because it's tucked in, you know, back further in the bed or, or in that foundation planting that um, I have not noticed if it does set a berry or not. Okay, next question is from Christine. Anything you can recommend that is dog friendly? Uh, this is another one. Um, with, with regard to these shade plants, I would say pretty much all of them are, um, there's nothing that jumps out at me that would be considered, you know, on the poisonous side. Um, so, and I, I believe if you, I'm trying to think of the website. Um, there is a website, even if you just Googled um, poisonous plants or poisonous landscape plants, I'm pretty sure there is a, um, uh, there is a site, because I know I've used it in the past, it, it just the, the name of that site escapes me. But you can always go through that site and, and see which plants, you know, that we've got on this list, if any of them show up uh, and cross-reference them. Okay, Paul, so this is from Joanne. Is fragrant olive the same as sweet olive with the bergamot fragrance? Uh, 
Earl Grey tea fragrance? Um, good question. That I do not know. This uh, all I know the 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 uh, osmanthus that variety the one that I talked about. It is it, it's a very sweet fragrance. Um, and and you know when it's wafting through the air, you you know it and you never forget it. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with the other one, so um, um, I I don't know. Okie dokie. So this one is from Kimberly. Is the heavenly bamboo a spreading plant? Uh, so it's you're right. It's that name could be deceptive. So it's not a bamboo. It's not a phyllostachys, which is the you know the rambling type that comes up everywhere. Um, it, it's just a, that that's why I like to call it. You know, I always go by the genus Nandina. So the um, it, it, it is not like the bamboo. If you're if that's what you're thinking of, uh, it does not grow that way. Okay, let me see. I think we have two more and that's it. It says this is from Mel. Are any of the camellias alkaline tolerant? Good question. Not that I'm and, and it, I guess it depends on how alkaline that soil is. Um, but no, camellias are not. They're going to want it a little south of seven. Um, if we're talking, you know, eight plus um you're gonna have to do some uh you know amending of that soil uh in order to uh get that camellia to make it happy so okay and last question what are your thoughts about i think it's abelia 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 um <laughs> again another one that does extremely well down here there's been a lot of new genetics out there um i've always had more success will it grow well in the shade uh sure um it blooms in the spring and there's a lot of new varieties out there that have um, really cool um variegated foliage um so even if they're not in bloom um you'll have something to look at so i think they will do well in the shade they may not bloom as much as uh, in the shade as they would maybe in the uh, full sun, but um, it's a plant that um, I think would would hold its own and do quite well in the shade. All right, let's see. Da, 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 da. Sago is sago, oh, sago or toxic, but what do you think of it in shade? Oh yeah, I, I mean it, it. It's similar, uh, you know, almost like a. It, it, it's sort of got that fern type look to it. So a, exactly, you you could use a sago uh, in the shade, and it would be fine. All right, let's see. They're coming in, Paul. Do you know the name of the mail order for camellia? Uh, actually, it, it's got camellia in the name, and I'm, I'm, it's not camellia run. Camellia forest, camellia forest nursery. Man, that's going back a ways remembering that. <laughs> um, so yeah, Camellia Forest Nursery is the name of that. Um, and I, it, it, it's either North Carolina or South Carolina, um, but they, they are in the Carolinas. Okay, uh, Josephina says, can you share the name of the Camellia Nurseries? Okay, that's the one I, I just, we just gave, gave that Camellia Forest Nursery okay. is the one. All right, uh, which Huchitera varies, varieties Hucra. do best? Hucra. 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 Uh, Hucra. Uh, Hucra. 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 Yeah, Hucras, I have not been, there's, gosh, when I was doing new product development, Hucra, there was a Hucra Americana that performed well in our heat and our humidity and didn't melt on me. Um, but some of the new ones that are out, it's uh, it's it's always deceiving. Um, there's a very good, very well known uh, Hucra breeder up in the Pacific Northwest, um, but if you look at their um, catalog, everything is hardy from zone. Now this is going back many years. Maybe they've cleaned it up, but they used to have you know their plants were hardy from zone four to zone ten, and even for their Hucras, and so and they had some incredible colors. Um, I'm I'm not a I love them, but I'm not just a, I'm not a big fan of them down here because I, I think people get 
enthralled with the wow factor of them, but the plants don't perform well under our conditions. So I normally don't uh, recommend them. Now there's some hybrids out there, which are heucarellas, which are hybrids of heucra and tiarella. Um, and I've heard some of them um, might have a little bit more staying power in our heat and humidity and, and wet conditions. Um, so I would say my recommendation is I, I, I personally stay away from them, even though I really love the way they look. Um, but again, you, there's always those microclimates. There's always people that can get them to grow for them. Um, and if you find that spot and you find that plant that works well for you, give it a shot. This is one of the great things about gardening. Um, you can always, you know, the plants don't always read the recommendations or, or the, 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 what's written up about them on the label or in the catalog. And some of these plants will do very well um as long as they're in the right spot and um so i would say give it a shot if there's one that you really like and and see if you can make it work okay um next question from cat do you recommend our native american beauty berry bush uh Abs yes birds? absolutely it's a great understory plant um so yes it 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 performs well uh, you know, when you see it in nature, it's always an understory, so um, it will do well. Um, you know, the the flowers are there. They're pretty insignificant, but the wow factor is in the fall, which is great because it's another time of year that will draw you out in the garden. So by all means, go for it. Yes. Okay. Do you recommend that for birds, Paul? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, yeah, because uh, they, they must come in and feed on them because when you... You see them in early fall, they're covered, and then next thing you know, all the all the seeds, you know, all the pods are gone. So I'm assuming those birds are coming through and, and feeding on them. So it's a good bird source. And, and Brandy might have a uh, better idea since she's our bird person. Um, if she wants to jump in and have any uh, comment on it. But I, I think, uh, yeah, they, they work extremely well. You said it, but yeah, they, the birds love it. Okay. Okay, so uh, what about Persian shields? Uh, yes, they will do well in the shade also. Um, you know, they will get uh, what, they can get pretty tall uh, in the landscape. But yeah, that, that purple silver color, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a good color, a good texture. So yes, absolutely go for it. Okay, Paul, what's the exact name of the camellia on your slideshow? The, the, the one that I, uh, is called uh, Yuletide, that was the Sasanqua, the red with the yellow stamens. And I do not know the name of the other one that sort of had that peony look, which was the Japonica. I don't know the name of that. I forgot the name of that variety. All right, that looks like it's it. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us um, next week on our homegrown lecture series. Uh, again, we will have the Backyard Poultry Part 2 with Mr. Shannon Dietz. Uh, so uh, thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your week. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Kim.